Good evening, folks. My name is John Hostiller. I serve the United States House of Representatives from 1995 to 2007 and serve the 8th District, which, from, uh, which now includes uh, Owen County. And for two of those terms that I served, uh, I was your congressman. Great to be back. And Spencer, uh, all across the country, Americans are becoming more and more concerned about the growing influence and intrusion of the federal government. And uh, uh, as citizens, we understand the importance of a strong central government that does that which the Constitution empowers it to do. But today, the government is so overreaching and so much moving out of its constitutional constraints that it's manifested in a way that has caused this concern. For example, today, the federal government is amassing massive annual uh, deficits. Uh, when I ran for Congress in 1994, originally, I stumped against a record $250 billion deficit. In February of 2010, the monthly deficit was almost $223 billion. Uh, that annualizes out to about $2.9 trillion of an annual deficit. We are uh, on the cusp of higher taxes, even though Congress last year passed an extension, a two-year extension of the tax cuts we put in place in 2001 and 2003. The fact is that investment is not taking place in our economy because those investors aren't going to invest in a, in a uh, situation whereby in less than two years, the return on investment will be wiped out by the largest tax increase in the history of the Republic. We also have the, the banking bailout, the precedent that was set by uh, Congress to uh, bail out banks who had made poor lending decisions. Uh, and it's, it was so politically unpopular that Congress put in the so-called financial regulation bill that they passed a $30 billion slush fund so in the future it would be automatically expended and they wouldn't have to take that type of vote again. Then we have an expansion of the health care system takeover, where, where the Affordable Health Care and Patient Protection Act, or whatever, is going to require every American to purchase their own health insurance, whether they believe they need it or not. The domestic auto industry takeover. At one time, it was said, as goes GM, so goes the nation. Given the fact that we are amassing trillions of dollars of deficit, it may be, in fact, that the government um, uh, will find out that it, like GM, is not too big to fail. And then there's the idea of controlling so-called greenhouse gases, um, that we will control the products, the natural products of combustion in an economy that is so dependent on the combustion of fossil fuels, which will wreck our economy when economies like China, Brazil, South Korea have no intention of, uh, of doing something that would harm their competitive state in the, in the world. And then there's the idea of stifling the political speech that would, that would criticize any of these moves, such as the reintroduction of the so-called Fairness Doctrine, which would require uh, local television and radio broadcasters to uh, uh, put on the air opinions that nobody cares about, and would require the federal government to essentially nationalize, and not the Fairness Doctrine, but campaign finance reform, would essentially nationalize our federal elections and make taxpayers pay for campaigns of candidates they don't support. So what's been the response from we the people? Well, there's been a universal call for the, for the federal government to return to operating within an objective standard. And there's been an overwhelming choice for that standard. And that standard is the United States Constitution. However, there's a problem. Uh, when we're talking about returning to the United States Constitution, uh, we have to recognize that the vast majority of us don't actually know what that means. In 2008, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute surveyed a little over 2,500 Americans with a uh, basic civic literacy test, about 37 questions, most of them about the federal government and the Constitution. More than 70% of those surveyed all across the country received a failing grade in basic civic literacy. Uh, when you include those who received a D, more than 90% of those surveyed either received a D or an F. Less than 1% received an A in basic civic literacy. They also found out some very interesting phenomena when, when they uh, surveyed college students. 
in a couple of the Ivy League schools, for example, they observe what's called negative learning, whereby students who are freshmen know more about the Constitution and know more about basic civic literacy, civil government, than do seniors in that same institution. So they are learning less, they know less, the longer they stay in college in these particular times. Now, this problem is pervasive, and I think it'd be a good idea to look at a couple or, or a few of the examples of this problem. And I might have you turn up the volume a little bit. ago, a few months ago, I uh, had an opportunity to speak to some uh, independent film producers and uh, among, uh, to talk about a, a few things. And uh, one of the things I asked, asked them after I gave them pre this presentation, especially this part, is if Hollywood can afford to put Chris Farley, David Spade, Brian Dennehy, Rob Lowe, Dan Aykroyd, Bo Derek in a picture, do they have a budget sufficient to do some research. And they said, well, yes. And, and these folks had actually uh, themselves been up for an Emmy in 2005 for a documentary they did on the War of 1812 for the History Channel. And they said, yeah, generally they, they want their screenplay to be as accurate as possible. Well, in this particular case, they failed miserably. And unfortunately, Marquette University, a prestigious uh, institution of higher learning, joined them in this folly uh, of education when we see that Thomas Jefferson, while a primary author of the Declaration of Independence, was actually a minister to France in 1787, he was not even in the country uh, during the time of the convention in Philadelphia during that summer, and so was not a delegate to the convention, could not be a framer of the document. Likewise, John Hancock, who preceded Herbie, uh, John Hancock, presided over the adoption of the, of the Declaration of Independence. It's his signature that's big and bold at the bottom of that document so that George III doesn't have to use his spectacles to read the signature. But similarly, he was governor of the state of Massachusetts in 1787, and likewise was not a delegate to the convention and had nothing to do with its framing by those delegates. Now, lest the philosophical left claim that we're picking on them, Unfortunately, we have some problems of our own, philosophically, and this might have to be a little louder. We recognize that we are all individuals. We love and revere our founding documents, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. We believe that the preamble of the Constitution contains an inarguable truth that we are all endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life. <laughs> Liberty. Freedom. 
and the pursuit of happiness. Now, those of you watching at home may wonder why this is being applauded. Well, I wasn't watching from home, but I was listening on the car radio as my son and I were driving back from Washington, D.C. I was actually a member of a panel at CPAP 2009 on the topic of foreign policy, and Matthew and I did not get to stay for Russia's speech at the very end of CPAP 2009, but we were listening to it on the radio as we were going through the hills and hollers of West Virginia. And when it came to this part, I swerved and just about went off the road when Rush suggested, as he did, that the preamble to the Constitution discusses inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Actually, it's in the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson penned those immortal words observing the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that are endowed by our Creator to us. Now, this misunderstanding on the part of the entertainment industry is one thing, whether it's the philosophical left in Hollywood or the philosophical right in radio talk show punditry. It simply reflects a widespread lack of knowledge in the country about the United States Constitution, uh, evidenced by the uh, evidenced by the 2008 survey we talked about earlier. However. There is a select, dare I say it, elite few that we would all agree should know better. So I would urge my Republican colleagues, uh, no matter how strongly they feel, you know, we have three branches of government. We have a House, we have a Senate, we have a President, and all three of us are going to have to come together and give some. But it is playing with fire to risk the shutting down of the government, just as it is playing with fire to risk not paying the debt seat. Folks, I only have four of these examples. I could be here all night with them. but. Uh... But before we talk about Chuck Schumer's idea of the three branches of government, let's uh, learn a little bit about Chuck Schumer. Uh, Senator Schumer is a graduate of the Harvard Law School, most prestigious law school in America, the oldest uh, uh, extant university in the country. He is the senior senator from the state of New York, and he is a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Prior to his service, in the Senate, on the Senate Judiciary Committee, he was a member of the House of Representatives for several years, where he likewise served on the House Judiciary Committee. As you all realize, the Senate Judiciary Committee has jurisdiction over the confirmation process, confirmation hearings at least, of members of the federal judiciary, including the federal district courts, the appellate courts, and the United States Supreme Courts. Now, according to Senator Schumer, we have three branches of government. And according to Senator Schumer, those three branches of government are, we have a House, we have a Senate, we have a President. Now, according to the United States Constitution, the three branches of government are delineated in first, Article I, the legislature or Congress, uh, Article II, the executive, uh, the unitary executive, the President of the United States, um, and the judiciary which is that branch of the federal government that Senator Schumer uh, sat on a committee when he was in the House as a House member to oversee and as a member of the, of the Senate, as a member of that uh, uh, committee to oversee in that body. Now, it's one thing when a senior senator with an education from the Harvard Law School uh, says this, these types of things, but it could be worse and it is. 